So I'm Rachel Finkelstein. I'm a master's student here at MIT in urban planning, and I just want to welcome you to our breakout session on local policy. Um, so with us today, we have three experts on our panel. Um, starting from the left, we have Henrietta Davis, who is the former mayor of the city of Cambridge, and Cynthia Green, the manager of the Climate and Energy Unit from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and one of my classmates, Eric Chu, um, from the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, a PhD student. Um, so the way this is going to go is we're going to hear from each of the winners. Um, they'll each speak for about three minutes, some by video, some here in person. And then after that, we're going to hear from each of our experts um, with some feedback and some ideas for the conversation that's going to happen afterwards. Um, so I guess we can get started. Um, we are first hearing from the food bikes contest, or the food bikes proposal, low capital, low footprint alternative to food trucks. And we have John here with us right now. Hi, John. Hello. Uh, my name is John Romankowitz. Uh, my friends call me Sustainable John, or SUSTI for short. And I'm a UC Berkeley graduate student in the Energy and Resources group. And uh, it's a great opportunity to speak here and potentially collaborate with you all. So thank you to Climate CoLab for that making that happen. So I wanted to start by talking about um, but the time when I lived in Beijing uh, for a couple of years. And I would often eat street food. Uh, it's, it was just right present on the streets, in the alleys, little carts and bicycles that serve food off the back of them with small little griddles just cooking up all sorts of really delicious food. Uh, it was something that was like really a big part of the urban fabric there and really brought livelihood to the city. Uh, when I moved back to the U.S., the food truck mo movement was really starting to grow. Um, it's grown very quickly. It's now a billion dollar market in the U.S. Um, but it also brings with it um, a very different um, characteristics from food bikes that I saw in, in China. So there's high capital costs. It costs at least $50,000 to start a food truck. It has a higher environmental footprint than, than restaurants where people normally eat, uh, because oftentimes uh, they're running off generators instead of uh, on the electricity grid. Um, so essentially what I really want to do is bring this street food and these food bikes from China to the US. I want to do kind of a reverse uh, technology transfer from, from the traditional sense. Uh, I want to do lower capital, lower footprint, uh, mobile food. So I'm introducing a food bike that's going to be one-tenth of the cost of a food truck. So instead of $50,000, $5,000. And the food bike is going to have a 50% less environmental footprint per meal served than food trucks. So I'm setting up the food bikery to make and produce these bikes and equip uh, food entrepreneurs with really a low capital, low footprint method to pursue mobile food in a way that's beneficial to them, the environment, and the city. Uh, now I'm digging into kind of two tracks of work so far. One is regulatory, working with the city and county uh, out here. And then one is kind of industrial design slash business planning. So on the industrial design and business planning, I'm trying to design the best bicycle that I can such that it's easy to use, and it's light, and it's capital efficient, um, and it's, it's fun and educational as well, but, uh, but can also produce enough product so that the entrepreneur can sell enough meals um, per shift to make it, uh, to have it make financial sense for them. And then on the other side, I'm uh, working with uh, regulators to analyze kind of the history of the mobile food facility code and how that's developed um, and how we can um, serve food off of basically bike trailers while still meeting health and safety requirements. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to look a lot different from what food trucks look like, and that's exciting. So uh, I, I was told I need, also need to maybe address like what I need help with. So uh, I'm looking to talk to all sorts of industrial designers and uh, to help with the design of my a trailer. I have an initial design already worked up and I have money to build it, but I'm kind of I'm tweaking the design, so I welcome a lot of feedback on that. 
And then I'm also interested in talking with folks with experience uh, working with city and county governments on new, introducing new regulations or changes to regulations, and particularly with uh, the food code and, and mobile food facility code. Um, I know that every city around the country is experiencing this, this, this growth in food trucks to some extent, um, but actually the regulations vary quite differently by geography. Um, so that's that's me. That's the food bikery, and uh, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, present my my initial idea. Great, thank you, John. Um, next, we're going to hear from Municipal Adaptation Strategy to Climate Change in Costa Rica with Sergio Molina Morillo. Yes, our strategy for our project is to make, uh, <laughs> develop a, a strategy for local adaptation to climate change in Costa Rica by empowering locals, local actors, particularly within the agriculture and, and water resource uh, sectors. Costa Rica, along with Central America, is considered a climate change hotspot, and this will create significant pressures on our biodiversity and productive systems. The recent studies by the United Nations that indicate that our economy is 85% at risk, mostly related to climate change. So in, this, in addition to that, in our particular municipality we're going to work on this, there are increasing pressure in terms of pollution, in terms of rapid and disorganized organization processes, which are going to just exacerbate the problems uh, that we have been trying to solve for the last 30 years in terms of development and poverty alleviation. So, um, our strategy basically goes into going to work on uh, mapping the current situation in terms of climate change knowledge and socioeconomic uh, environmental vulnerability. Then, in a participatory multi stakeholder process with the municipal, municipal approval, which by the way, we already got the commitment, we're going to create a climate change commission, we'll develop a climate change adaptation uh, strategy that is officially adapted at the local government. Then in the second phase, we're going to work at the district level, so at the municipality, at the county level, at the district level, we're going to create uh, plans to adapt and reduce uh, vulnerability to, to climate change. And then uh, in these two particular sectors, the idea is to uh, create uh, and, and initiate some, adapt some technologies, agroecological agro, technologies, and in a way that we can make this community, this local government, uh, more resilient to climate change, uh, manage the risk, and actually create opportunities for continual sustainable development. Um, who we are? So we are at the National University of Costa Rica. The team is uh, built by a multi-stakeholder um, or multi-disciplinary uh, group of experts. And actually, the one key, the key thing that we're going to be doing is that we are um, a legitimate trusted actor in the process. Municipality, local government normally are not, and universities actually are, for many years, rated as the most reputable or trusted organization within the country, state universities. And so we're going to be the facilitators of that, of course, with our knowledge and expertise. We're going to build this process of awareness, training, education, and technologically adapting with them so that these could be. Established here, we have, we have already done this in other municipalities, not completely like in this case. So now we're bringing all the team together to build a complete case. And from this, we can replicate into other uh, municipalities around the country and hopefully through Central America, which face similar issues. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from the Stop Groundwater Plan, save $8 billion from Saeed Majdi. So we have two guys from Texas, that's Dr. Tom and I and me. Uh, one is currently a problem in Las Vegas and a solution in California. Uh, that's based on systems thinking and uses desalination. Desalination that will virtually extend the Colorado River all the way to the Pacific Ocean. 
Let's see how that could happen. You know, Las Vegas was founded in the Nevada desert in 1905. It uses, what well, gets 90% of its water from nearby Lake Mead. It gets its water from Colorado River. Uh, the Bureau of Reclamation of the Department of the Interior administers the withdrawal of water from the Colorado River that goes to Las Vegas, to Southern California, and to other users. All these users have specific allotment or share of water. Las Vegas, though, is expecting massive population growth and also <coughs> drought caused by climate change. But they are worked out a solution that they call the groundwater plan. This groundwater plan consists of pumping groundwater from the eastern region of Nevada and transporting it all the way to Las Vegas over a 263-mile course. A little bit of a problem. Uh, experts and uh, civic and environmental groups think it's not a good idea. They are proposing this groundwater plan. They think that it would be environmentally destructive and very costly at the price tag of $15 billion. Our plan that we propose as an alternative is the desalination plan. Uh, it consists of getting California to accept locally desalinated water from the Pacific Ocean in exchange for foregoing some of its allotment that it gets from the Colorado River so that it can go directly to Las Vegas. In exchange, Nevada pays for the desalination plant and a concentrating solar power plant that will power this desalination plant. We believe this is a better approach to the groundwater plant. We have broken down this desalination plant to three stages. In the first stage, we're going to form an advisory committee to address, among other things, legal and institutional issues to make sure that there is a legal uh, vehicle available for the implementation of the desalination plan. If the desalination plan is implemented, we believe that both Nevada and California will get the water that they need without <coughs> depleting the groundwater resources they have in eastern Nevada and without destroying the environment in the process. Now, the help that we need right now is to get the word out because the groundwater plan is a de facto solution. There is no other uh, uh, alternative to it. Uh, the civic and environmental groups that I mentioned earlier that are in opposition to the groundwater plan, but if they know about the desalination plan that we are proposing, then their opposition would be more successful. Thank you. Next, we're hearing from Green Up, engaging communities to build green and resilient cities in India with Aditi Sen. Hello, everyone. I'm Aditi, and I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, so my proposal, Green Up, supports urban communities to create green, climate smart cities, and it does this by connecting communities, um, providing communities access to funds, local partners, and uh, information. So in 2012, Hurricane Sandy flooded the streets of New York, washing away homes, destroying businesses. In 2009, Typhoon Kitsana devastated the city of Manila. And in 2005, my city, Mumbai, uh, witnessed the worst flooding in its history, killing over 1,000 people and countless others' lives to destroy, particularly of poor people who live in the city's low-lying areas in slums. Cities are increasingly at the risk, um, are increasingly on the front lines of climate change impacts, particularly <laughs> flooding. And the risks are worst for mega cities in Asia, which are among the fastest growing cities in the world. But small actions that communities can take can make a big difference. 
So planting a tree, for example, can actually absorb around 4,000 gallons of water a year. So actions like uh, creating gardens, planting trees, um, uh, make a huge difference in making cities resilient by absorbing stormwater, providing other benefits such as reduced heat island effects, improved air quality, and quite frankly, greener cities are quite nicer to live in. But in many cities um, around the world, particularly in developing countries, these cities are growing unsustainably. But it doesn't have to be that way. Building green climate smart cities <laughs> is possible. In the slums of Mumbai, a small community worked with a local nonprofit to transform a garbage dump into a garden. Now imagine if this were to happen across the city, across several cities. And it can happen if community groups get the support they need. And that's what cleanup is about, providing communities the support they need to create green climate smart cities. And it does this in three simple ways. One, crowdfunding that uh, enables communities to raise funds both from individuals as well as from organizations. Two, working with local partners who can provide the support needed to implement such projects on the ground. And three, tools for learning and sharing. So this is really about crowds and planning. Using crowds to connect communities to money, people, and ideas. Because some money is not the only thing that matters, right? So how would this work? So a community wants to build, install a green road. Let's say a school wants to install a green road. We help them raise funds to the platform. We connect them with local partners who can provide technical support needed to implement the green roof, and we provide tools that support their learning over time, and also that allows them to share their own story, and, ho and hopefully their story will then inspire others in the community to take similar actions. So that's the idea. So in terms of impacts, uh, we're looking to increase green spaces within cities um, and foster ecological awareness. Uh, to date, um, we road tested the idea um, in Bombay and we received positive uh, response, but we do, you know, there's a huge potential for something like this um, to go to scale, but to do that, we need your support. First and foremost, we're looking for collaborators. Um, if you want to help build out the technology, or if you want to contribute your expertise, um, or your connections to a platform like GreenUp, I'd love to connect with you. Um, we are also obviously looking for some funding. Um, to take it to the next level. Um, so if you, know, you can fund us or know someone who can fund us, again, I'd love to connect with you. Um, I've been a city person all my life, hence my Twitter name, Urban Wolf Mom. And cities face a lot of challenges, but cities are also the center of innovation, India, creativity. There's tremendous amounts of energy and talent in cities, and if we can collect, you know, actually harness that energy and um, creativity in cities, we can actually transform that challenge into an opportunity. The journey to a climate smart world starts with our communities. Let's make that happen with Green Up. And last, we're hearing from future mangroves, and we will be watching a video that they can join us in person today. The proposal of Future Mangrove addresses uh, specific uh, challenges. Uh, one, to improve the economic status of coastal communities. Two, to provide uh, protection to eroding coasts. Three, an adaptation measure to rising sea level. In this proposal, coastal communities collect and germinate uh, mangrove seeds and uh, grow them in uh, modules containing more than one seedling each. The modules are constructed from uh, available uh, local materials such as coconut coil or shell or trunk. Small machine shops produce the mangrove seeds and uh, set up to manufacture the uh, modules in bulk. Villagers develop additional skills in deploying the modules to the coast. As mangroves mature, additional roots uh, could be obtained in a sustainable manner. When the mangroves are fully developed, these are a uh, potential for ecotourism. The main stakeholders are villages from a coastal community. The local or provincial government and the private sector uh, will be involved when necessary. The project is to be implemented in the Philippines or in Indonesia. 
vision where the needs of the coastal communities are the greatest. The project is replicable in other coastal areas in developing countries. This project has many benefits. Coastal communities benefit from progressive development as mangroves uh, provide increasingly provisioning, regulating and cultural services as they mature. Planting, man planting mangroves on a modular scale in climate ch is climate change adaptation as mangroves uh, protect eroding coasts are buffered to four to five uh, meter uh, tsunami waves. Keep up with sea level rise of one millimeter per annum if more if conditions are suitable and mangroves are carbon sink. The total cost of the uh, proposed project is uh, $20,000 for immediate implementation without uh, involving research and uh, development costs. I have already taken uh, several steps uh, to make the uh, proposal a reality, develop contact with interested parties uh, in Southeast Asia in implementing the project, develop contact with NGOs for joint application for funding, gain experience in sourcing mangrove seeds, germinating and planting, plot out various uh, mangrove designs made from uh, local materials. To implement the uh, proposal, funding is required from price money, matching funds from the private uh, sector from NGOs, portion of my energy. In conclusion, planting mangroves on a modular scale contributes to the economic development of coastal communities, <laughs> protects eroding coasts, and is a climate change adaptation to rising sea level. The project can be implemented immediately and is a win-win case for development and adaptation. us again about what, what you would like us to be commenting on. First of all, I, I will say that I'm very, uh, I'm Henrietta Davis, former mayor of this, of your fair city here in Cambridge. And um, I'm a, um, I'm, I'm very impressed with these proposals and uh, the grandeur of them. Uh, they far outstrip anything we've ever done locally, that's for sure. Uh, although the bikes are more on that <coughs> small local kind of level. Uh, I'm, I'm a tremendous supporter of local action. I think that uh, local action has made all the difference in our country in terms of response to climate change. Um, if, especially if you consider, you can consider Cambridge a city of 100,000, uh, Boston, Chicago, uh, New York. These are where all the heroic actions are taking place in our country. It's at the municipal level uh, and it's with municipal government as well as local stakeholders. So um, I, I, a, um, I have one, one minute. Am I done yet? <laughs> uh, so uh, I guess my, uh, my key uh, challenge question uh, for the proposals or for discussion is about stakeholders, really. And um, since climate change is a, a, a worldwide problem uh, that needs everybody to be a part of it, how do these proposals engage uh, the right stakeholders to make the right kinds of decisions? Um, in terms of government, as you look at these proposals, as I do, uh, I think some of these have governmental uh, obstacles that I wouldn't want to have to deal with. Um, and others are really within reach. And, um, and that, uh, I always, when I'm looking at uh, solutions on the local level, I'm looking for what can we do. What can we do with the powers that we already have uh, that can make a big difference? So uh, in Cambridge, I'm going to go do a, a little plug. We have a net zero task force. Uh, one of the members of the task force, at least one, is here uh, with me today. And our intention is by uh, 2050 to reduce our carbon emissions uh, to zero uh, from buildings. And so uh, we think we can do that because we have the power. We're not asking for anything different. We're asking. We're engaging stakeholders, uh, building a movement, uh, and uh, going forward block by block to make that happen. So anything uh, that um, where you have the power almost there already, I see that as something that's worth pursuing, uh, very worth pursuing, and uh, analyzing how it engages the many uh, in the solution of climate change, I think, is one of the challenges that we all should be looking at. 
that the right answer to the right questions? <laughs> Here you go. Okay, um, I'm Eric. I'm a PhD student at um, at Just, um, and um, I would love to echo what Andrea was talking about. Um, and I think they brought me on because um, they wanted somebody to speak to an urban context outside of the U.S. context. Um, so, um, building off of this table there, um, I've heard um, the very innovative projects out here um, to consider um, the institutional, politi political, and economic contexts that these projects are trying to operate in, in the cities themselves. Um, de developing country cities obviously have a lot of constraints. Um, economically, politically, but they also have a lot of opportunities uh, because of these constraints. A lot of experiments and innovations have been going on. So I would urge um, some of these projects um, to find synergies um, within the cities themselves, with people that are already working in them, to try to find mutual interests. Um, for example, um, Costa Rica is one has, has a lot of adaptation projects going on already. Indian cities, um, a lot of new building technologies are already happening. So what are potentials for further partnerships within these cities? How can we kind of better account for shared benefits? How can we share information between some of these innovations and experiments? Um, and how do we better match funds, capacities, resources in a, in a constrained context? Um, and just to get the biggest bang out of our buck. So I think that's... Okay. It's nice to go left because they said a lot of one things I was thinking about, and thank you, Henrietta, for really starting that off. Um, Cynthia Green and I worked for EPA in Boston, so I work on a regional level. Um, and I think a couple of things that I saw was looking at what we already have that potentially could play into these things. And I'm thinking of um, the food bites, one of the things that they're Grasping, grappling with is the issue of refrigeration. Could we use the infrastructure that we are putting in place for electric vehicles to help them out? Are there infrastructure pieces like that that are already out there that potentially would help some of these other projects? One of the other areas I'm thinking about also is the public engagement. Um, we all probably in this room understand climate change. I don't believe on a global scale people really do understand global climate change. And I was thinking about the green infrastructure. Um, and some people, I sort of was talking about it because I was fascinated by this crowdsourcing idea. And someone said to me, well, who would fund that? And I said, OK, do you really understand that now we're talking about the 1 in 100 year storm being 8 and a half inches of rain? When you think about that, and you think about where would I be when that happens, and how much rain, how, how would that affect me? Maybe you would think about, maybe I want to control some of that stormwater. So I think the public engagement really is important to make sure they understand this issue. And then finally, I want to just address this issue of thinking really outside of the box and thinking outside of just your local. Um, and I think that really is the LA and Las Vegas pro pro project where you didn't say, I'm going to be constrained by just what's here in my local area in Las Vegas, and think much more globally about what are the water sources. Um, and I love that project and the, the thinking about the economics of it. It saves money by thinking outside of the box and possibly solving the problem in a very different way. So can we think regionally to solve the local problems, and um, if you were at the session earlier today, Reggie, um, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, really did that. Um, they took it outside of the states, and they said, let's look at this regionally. So regional public engagement um, and what's out there that we already can use. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, so they're going to stick around while we break up into groups and brainstorm. Um, so the goal is to come up with ideas together about how we can best help out the presenters with all the ideas that we saw today. How can we put those into action? Um, so the presenters will be here as well um, to answer any questions, take your feedback, and we'd also like to encourage you to, um, when you discuss these proposals, to submit your feedback online as well on the Colette website or on the app on your phones. Thank you. <laughs>